All right, this is another Monday. Hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, we need to get started on this. Let me start by saying this is not a basic brakes principles video. It's got more to do with doing brake jobs, working on brakes, fixing them the right way. And is there's, I guarantee you, even if you do brakes every day, there's going to be something you're going to get out of this if you'll stay, stay with me that you didn't know already. Now, a lot of it you may already know if you've done a lot of brakes because brakes are something that's done a lot. Some shops just do nothing but brakes and uh, <laughs> that's pretty handy. Um, you know, although occasionally you can get blindsided even if you're good at doing brakes by one that beats you up. But <clears throat> let's go ahead and jump into this thing and see if I can get started on it. Now, whenever you're talking to somebody about doing a brake job on their vehicle, if they're bringing it to you, say, well, if we're picking the pads and deciding how we're going to handle this, uh, what kind of uh, replacement parts we're going to use, we need to ask good questions about their brake problem. Uh, an aggressive driver or somebody that tows or carries a lot of heavy loads may need upgraded pads or rotors, while vehicle owners that don't do anything except maybe take their kids to, uh, to soccer uh, might need pads that aren't quite so, uh, you know, aggressive. But... <clears throat> Ceramic pads are good if you don't want dust, although I have had ceramic pads that dusted the rotors up just as bad as pads that weren't ceramic. Um, there's various different types of pads and you can research that. I'm not going to go into a lot of that here. <clears throat> but the simple fact is you need to try to pick the pad that's best for the kind of driving that your customer does. Um, and so take the time to find out what kind of driving they do. A good inspection is a lot more than looking at the amount of remaining brake lining. I had this bucket that I put used up brake pads <clears throat> label on it and I would have all my students put their brake pads in this bucket and then whenever we were uh, the bucket was full I would have them take it over there and over next to the welding department there was a scrap iron bin and I would have them dump all of these pads in the scrap iron bin. That's really better than throwing them in the trash you know because you know, they're technically they're scrap iron so it's not a bad thing to throw those in a bucket and then put them in a scrap iron bin when you're done. You don't have to do that. There's no law, but I always like to do that anyway. Now do a test drive. Unless the brakes are totally shot and are grinding the rotors away, check the brake fluid level first. Look and just see what you can see, you know, without... Some guys might want to raise it up and look at it, but before I raise it up, I'm going to check the brake fluid level. I'm going to see what the pedal feels like. Then we're going to test drive it to see what we notice. Noises, pulsation, anything else, or whether it's pulling one way or another. And you might be surprised at what customers won't tell you. They'll just come in there and say they want a brake job done without telling you why they want the brake job done. All right. Does the park brake work? Is the pedal low? Does it feel normal and then fall away while you're holding pressure on the pedal? Well, those are all good questions. Uh, look at the warning lights. Check for heat at one brake. If it's got heat at one brake pad, uh, then you may have something wrong with that wheel or rotor or pad or, or sticking caliper or something like that. Usually you'll feel that when you're driving it. Uh, is, the, is the ABS or brake light illuminated? Is one of the brake assemblies noticeably hotter? The rusty rotor thing right here. I wanted to talk about this for a minute. This is important. See this rusty rotor? We worked on a uh, <clears throat> car one time. It was a Chrysler Sebring. I think it was a 2002 model. And uh, she was talking about one of her rotors was rusty like this. Uh, and the, well, the, both of the rear rotors were rusty. And she didn't feel like the car stopped quite as good as it should have. And I drove it, and it, you know, it was hard to, it was sort of a subjective thing, but she was noticing that she didn't like the way it stopped. Uh, I mean, I was, my leg was a little stronger than hers. I probably didn't have so much of a problem with the power brakes and all that. But we discovered that the uh, proportioning valve, that was feeding, it was supposed to feed fluid to the back brakes after the front ones were applied, you know, that keeps it from skidding and sliding off of the road and all when you're going around a wet curve. In other words, it applies the front brakes first and then it lets some uh, fluid go to the back ones. If you let too much go to the back ones, it'll slide the back wheels and there's other reasons for that too. But the point is, she had a bad brake proportioning valve and so we had to replace that to get her some fluid going to those rear brakes. Uh, the pedal felt good and hard, but there was just no fluid getting through that proportioning valve because something was wrong with it on the inside. That's not usually something you see, but we did see it on that one. Does it have loose front end parts, mismatched or worn tires, anything else that might cause odd braking issues? Just think about it, you know. Don't miss anything if you can help it. 
the brake lines and hoses on all four wheels are important. Uh, are the steel lines badly rusted or routed through deep wet inside mud on the frame rails? Uh, I have run into pickup trucks that would have uh, a lot of uh, mud that was caked inside there and that kept those steel brake lines um, <clears throat> wet all the time to where they rusted. Uh, anytime a brake line is languishing in water like that it's going to rust through if it's a steel brake line. Now typically the most shops uh, will replace it with that NICOP, uh, that nickel copper line that's so easy to work with and it's really strong, it's made for brakes it's e and it's easy to double flare and all that. But this brake line like you see me holding in my hand right there, that's my hand holding that brake line. Um, this was on a 2500 series Chevy truck and the guy, the welding instructor had been a, he had run a oil chain shop that did a lot of brake work and all. He was convinced he had a bad master cylinder. And so he brought it to us over there and he says, put a master cylinder on my truck. So we did. But he still had a lousy brake pedal. So we just did what he said because I felt, well, he knows what he's talking about. Well, it turned out the brake line, this is a picture of the brake line on that truck. That brake line, uh, that rust, that, that line has got to hold 2,000 pounds of pressure, particularly in a panic stop. Usually whenever you're doing a normal stop, it's holding probably 12, 1,500 pounds of pressure. But if you stand on it hard, there's over a ton per square inch of pressure inside that line. That's one of the reasons the lines are so small. And uh, a rusty brake line is a bad thing. Volkswagen used to run there, on the rabbits, used to run the brake lines underneath the carpet. And they had a recall on those because uh, the brake lines were, you know, prone to get rusty. And, um, of course, a lot of the mechanics would just, they'd say, you're supposed to look, and if you can scratch it and you see bubbles of rust on it, you're supposed to replace the brake lines, you know. I mean, that was a recall they did. I was at a Volkswagen dealer when we did that. And, uh, but years later, uh, I was driving an 83 Rabbit. Uh, I don't know if the recall had never been done or if one, whoever did it just didn't fool with uh, doing the, you know, replacing the lines or whatever. But I, I stepped on the brake, and that thing blew a brake line up under the carpet and I had to do a gunslinger thing and pull the parking brake real fast to slide up to the stop uh, in an intersection. I would have gone right on through that thing, got plowed into by cars if I hadn't have pulled that park brake up as quick as I did. <clears throat> but anyway, these rusty brake lines are something that really need to be addressed. If all of the brake lines are rusty, like if you're in the salt belt, you know, where all the rust is, where they put salt on the roads, uh, replacing all the brake lines can be a pain but it's really dangerous driving with brake lines that are really rusty, so pay attention to that. The rubber brake hoses leak and crack, swollen. Uh, rubber brake hoses like this, if one of them is internally, look, can look good on the outside and inside, it can actually be slowing the fluid down so that when you mash the brake, it begins to pull, but as you continue to stop, it straightens up. That's because the fluid is not going through uh, the hose in other words, if you see one that, that pulls and then cleans up its act as, it's, as you're stopping, you need to probably replace both of those front brake hoses and then bleed the brakes. I mean, that's the best way to handle that and then redrive it. Um, there are also tools you can put in there uh, that you can buy to the brake, to put, the, uh, the, put this thing in between the pad and the rotor, you know, how to retract the pads and then mash the brake looking at the gauges on both sides. And you can see how much pressure is being applied to those brakes. I should have put a picture of that because I had a cop, I had a set of those gauges, and that's pretty handy when you're trying to find a pull. You know why the brakes are pulling. Some people just look at the rotors. I've actually seen people just reach in there and you know rub their thumb on the rotor like that's a big deal. The thing about it is, even if your brake pads are still good, because there's dirt and rocks and sand and stuff going up in there, you may have a rotor that looks like this one right here, um, that's not smooth and pretty like a brand new rotor. Uh, but it's more important to look at the pads and see what kind of wear is left on them, see if they're both wearing the same, so on and so forth. Of course, there are people that just keep on driving. They ignore the noise, and you end up seeing stuff like this. You know, this is a silly bunch of nonsense, but there are people that do that. And I've actually seen some of them. That, that, I mean, there was a Lincoln that came in there. The entire, uh, this part of the rotor was completely gone, and all that was left was the hat where the park brake was. I had a picture of that, but I forgot to insert it in the PowerPoint presentation. Drum brakes are still a thing. <clears throat> Back several years ago, well, I mean a long time ago, probably 20 years ago, um, I was asked to put together a test station for a Skills USA competition, and I got a brand new axle that Ford had sent me, 12 brand new rear axle assemblies, um, and I 
cut the ends off one of those axles and built these stands that you see right here. See this stand right here? And I put an axle in there. Of course, the, the hub and all is not there. I should have probably figured out a way to put that in there. But the point is, these students were supposed to take those brake shoes off and put them back on. I could do it in three minutes. Take them off, put them on in three minutes using these tools. But And I would tell them, I would do it, I'd demonstrate it, and I'd say, your job is to beat my time. Do it faster than me. <laughs> and But when I took this thing up there for the competition, I went up to Birmingham or somewhere, and uh, there was 36 high school automotive students up there, and only four of that 36 knew anything about drum brakes. And that was like in 2003 or four. And, and I says, uh, you know, drum brakes are still on a lot of these vehicles. They said, well, well you know, drum brakes are going away. We're not taught about drum brakes at the school. You know, and uh, it was, I would, bless their hearts, I would have to show them how to do it and then grade them on how fast they did it to decide who won that stage of the competition. You know, there's a bunch of different stations that they had to go through and the brakes that I sent took up were just one of them. But that was ridiculous. Uh, there's still drum brakes. Even now, there's cars that are still being made with drum brakes. Uh, you can do some research on that. Get into your Bing Copilot and, and type in which vehicles still come with drum brakes. You know, like cars and light trucks. You'll be surprised. There are some that still have rear brakes drum. None of them have them on the front, but a lot of them are still having them on the rear for various different reasons. These brakes here have got a leak of some kind because they're all sooty and wet. And so we're going to clean those off too. We probably have a leaking wheel cylinder. Look at there. That's not too hard to troubleshoot, is it? Now he's got to have some wheel cylinders or we could rebuild those. And he's got to have brake pads. You can see these brake pads are just about worn down to the rivets anyway. So we're going to measure the brake drum. And we're going to see if it's too big. If it's not, we're going to machine the brake drum. Pretty good deal here. This one here looks really good. You pull the rubber back there. We don't see any blown wheel cylinder there, but we are going to have to wash the dust off of these. Now, if the rear brakes are gummy and wet, you need to find out if it's an axle seal or if that brake fluid. I used to tell my students, I said, if you want to know really quickly if it's axle seal or base brake fluid, touch it and touch it to your tongue. You can instantly taste it if it's brake fluid. You know, and you can tell the difference that way really fast between whether if you know if you fix one thing without fixing that, like if you put a wheel cylinder on it and clean all that off and it comes back greasy again, you're in a mess. So you need to know what it is. Sometimes they may both be leaking. Uh, but one way or another, uh, one of the things you don't need to do is you don't need to blow the brake dust off with an air hose, even if they're, they're, they're dry, because that uh, mesothelioma is no fun. It's like smoking 100,000 cigarettes and it's not nearly as much fun and mess up your lungs. Those little pieces of black dust if you look at them microscopically, they have little saw blades and they get embedded in your lungs and that is nasty, nasty stuff. So do not use an air blower to blow that stuff off. Now you check your rotor thickness and your drum diameter. Pay attention to what the book says about the specs and replace them. If they're really, really close to being too thin, don't machine them or have them machined. Uh, you need to go ahead and replace them because rotors don't cost that much anyway. If you go to carparts.com like, for example, on my Explorer, I can get a set of rotors and pads uh, for a little over $100. Occasionally, you'll see a really good deal at uh, Advanced Auto Parts or somewhere where they've got uh, a special where they're selling pads and rotors like for that. And, but know how to use the tools. Now, I will tell you, if you don't know how to read this drum micrometer, then in this drum, drum micrometer cost about 500 bucks if you buy one like this. <clears throat> but the long and the short of it is, um, I had to teach. I taught my students how to use this, and it's, I'm not going to take the time to explain how to use it now. But not as hard as you'd think, uh, but it's kind of peculiar because you got to set it up exactly the right way before you can measure the drum with it. But uh, if you don't know how to use that, and you got and you're in doubt, just put a drum on it because they don't cost all that much either, typically, uh, in the grand scheme of things, anyway. Now rotor. Parallel. This see that lateral run out test I did on that rotor there. Whenever we had that dial indicator against it, and we were spinning that thing through, that needle was just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is a good rotor. This is a rotor that's not. It's got scrub, scrub like run out. Lateral run out means it is quit waggling back and forth the whole rotor. And then rotor parallelism. You have thick spots and thin spots. I had my my Ford pickup back in. It was a '74 model Ford pickup. I had F100. 
and that darn thing uh, would get, would develop a brake pulsation. And so I took the uh, rotors to the machine shop, had them cut, machined, put them back on there, and it got to where it was doing that again. So there was hard and soft spots on the rotor for whatever reason. And every time I would have a machine, it didn't last very long before they started pulsating again. Finally, I just replaced the rotors and I took care of the problem. So if you got a brake pulsation, and you got to remember, it could be the back or the front. When my son Matt was working with the tire store down there, uh, standard procedure if you got a brake pulsation is you know do a front brake job and machine the rotors. And so he did a freight front brake job on a on a Cherokee or Grand Cherokee or something, and um, it uh, didn't take care of the pulsation problem. So he went back told the guy that ran the tire store, he says, this thing still got a brake pulsation and I machined the rotors to replace the pads. And the, the owner of the tire store looked at his watch and says, yes, you'll be here in about 45 minutes to pick this thing up. And here we are with our pants down around our ankles. Well, they wound up having to do the rear brakes to fix it and they didn't even charge her for that. <laughs> that was just funny. Now this was me on wheat harvest in Kimball, Nebraska in 1975. I was 18 years old. And when the brakes crapped out on the grain trucks or anything else went wrong, they would drag me out of the combine, that air-conditioned combine cab, to have me work on the trucks. Uh, because I was the only mechanic that they had on the crew, except the boss man knew how to do mechanic work, but he didn't have time, or he didn't want to. And so I wound up having to do a lot of this kind of stuff. And you can't see it, but there's actually a, you know, a stand and a block under there holding that truck up. So there's no danger of it falling on me there. End of the story is it didn't fall on me anyway. Uh, but I was working on a, uh, I, put, I had to put a wheel cylinder on that one or something. I was working on getting that line started when somebody took that picture. Like if they're wearing wedge shaped or, you know, thin. It's always a good idea to make sure these operate freely like that one does. This one here is kind of stiff. You see how you can move it and it kind of stays there. This one here doesn't. This one here operates pretty smoothly, but that one's stiff. And so what we need to do is we need to straighten those out. So we're going to do a little short video here on how we make that happen. See that right there? We can pull these boots on. You can get these boots from the parts house to replace these. All right. But in this particular case, we're going to be able to reuse those boots because they look pretty good. But see how this is all dry? That's the right thing to do. But well, we can go ahead and pull them all apart, clean them up, make sure they're... See, that one there is kind of greasy and wet. It's got these little uh, channels cut in here for grease to ride. That particular one is slightly different in its design. It doesn't have the channels for the grease to ride, but the other one does. Now, I don't know... Take Job. Caliper pistons sometimes stick and have to be replaced or rebuilt. Usually, the parts store won't have caliper kits or wheel cylinder kits in stock anymore. Now, that was something that uh, the caliper kits, you can get them, but they usually have to special order them because almost nobody rebuilds calipers. You can also buy these pistons. And so the caliper kit comes with this. Those O-rings are square cut and they kind of act like a return spring. They, they distort a little whenever the piston extends. But that boot is right here and this seal is inside here. And so when the pressure goes in here, you might notice as the pads wear, this piston continues to extend more and more and it causes the brake fluid to get a little bit low. And if the brakes have been on there for a while, the pads are getting a little thinner, you might notice low brake fluid, you might notice the brake light coming on until you drive a little bit and then it goes off because the fluid heats up and expands and they add a little fluid to them. And that's one of the reasons that, when it's, because fluid's usually been added when you retract the uh, rotor, I mean the brake pads, when you're putting new brakes on there, it'll usually run the brake master cylinder over and fluid will wind up dripping on the floor down there unless you draw some fluid out before you do that. Um, then you got wheel cylinders that sometimes leak and have to be replaced. I had a video a while ago of, you know, checking that. If you see one that's obviously wet like this, you can tell that that wheel cylinder needs to be replaced. You can get a kit, which you know, most of the kits come with boots, a spring, two cups, and pistons. Now, a lot of the times they won't include the pistons, but they'll include the cups, and they're by size, the size that you have, you know, 15, 16, one inch, one and a quarter, whatever. That'll be the size cups you need. The guy that I worked for back in the uh, late 70s at that shop, I worked for about six or seven months at a shop here in town. <clears throat> and every single brake job we did, and a lot of the vehicles back then had front and rear brakes on drum brakes, uh, we would rebuild the wheel cylinders every single time we did a brake job. And we also resurfaced the drums. Um, and that was way back in the, you know, 1977. But um, that's... Uh, that's an important thing. However, 
most of the time you can buy a wheel cylinder for less than $15 for most vehicles. And that's a, it's a good thing. So everything that you see here is inside here. Uh, that's the point on that. You know, piston cup, boot, and that spring in the middle and all that. So anyway, now on your drums and your discs, uh, if they're machinable, do it if you have the equipment. Uh, wash them with soap and water after you machine them to get rid of the foul ends and it'll help prevent squealing. Brake parts cleaner will not wash those foul ends out of there. As a matter of fact, if you look up uh, procedures on this from the Bendix Corporation that makes brakes, they will tell you in no uncertain terms that the best thing you can wash rotors with after you've, or the best way you can clean them after you've machined the rotors is to wash them with soap and water. If you remember, any of you guys that have done engine work, washing the you know, soap and water is what you use whenever you're honing cylinders, too. Uh, you know, nothing else works as good. Uh, brake fluid works okay, but soap and water makes a lot of sense. And uh, I used to actually have, teach my students, we'd have a big bucket with soap and water in it or a big tank, and we would wash the, these and dry them off really good. And you'd be surprised what that will do to keep them from developing a squeaking sound later on. Uh, and if you're not putting new rotors on it and you're machining them, it's the best to wash them with soap and water. Um, drums included, the uh, same way. The, the rotors are more important that do that, though. A vehicle that comes in with jury-rigged brakes should not be released back to the customer that way. One time, this lady brought a <clears throat> or sent her daughter over there from the other campus, and she had a Grand Cherokee that she wanted the brakes done on. And I called the parts guy. He didn't ask me if it had ABS or anything else. He just gave me a price for the brake rotors and pads. And so whenever it got there, uh, we took the wheels off, and it was a jury-rigged bunch of haywire junk that, like you wouldn't believe, it was downright dangerous. And um, I found out also that it had ABS on it, and that meant the rotors were more expensive than what I had originally priced them. And the job went from like $130 up to $225 because the rotors were that much more expensive. And so... Uh, I called this lady and told her it was going to cost more than what I had originally had quoted her. And she was really unhappy about that. Uh, but I also forgot the fact when I was talking to her that she needed a $25 uh, hardware kit because a lot of her hardware was missing. Uh, but anyway, it was kind of funny because whenever um, her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend came back over there to get that vehicle, and uh, I showed them that the bill was $250 because of that extra $25 hardware kit. She, I, she called her mother from my office phone, and I could hear all the way from where I was her mother yelling and screaming and hollering because the bill was, was so higher. We fixed those brakes right. We put all the hardware in there just like it was supposed to be. Everything was just like it was when it was brand new because if she had, if we, she had told us to let it go the way it was, or if we took it apart and put it back together wrong, it was on us, you see. So, I mean, that is a, a very difficult situation, but if they absolutely refuse and they don't want you to do any more work on their vehicle, disable the vehicle, tell them to send a wrecker after it because you're not going to let them drive it out of there with the brakes like that because even if they sign a waiver, shops have done that and still lost lawsuits because they let the car go uh, with brakes that, you know, they were put back together wrong because the person didn't want it fixed. But anyway, she was on the phone screaming and hollering at her daughter. <laughs> and the, the boyfriend was shaking his head, looking real scared. He goes, this is not good, not good. Well, anyway, she wrote the check out for 250 bucks, and a bill was paid. And I turned it into the business office and all that. But see, uh, the thing about it is, in spite of the fact that she was furious and would probably never let us work on her vehicle again, nobody anywhere could say we didn't do that brake job the right way. That's important. Because the brakes is not something you need to modify or piddle with unless you're going to upgrade them. You know, if you're going to upgrade the brakes with something that's, uh, you know, I mean, it's a DOT approved and all that, that's a good thing. Now, do your drum brakes one side at a time if you're not sure you can remember how they go back. And don't be bashful about replacing the hardware if the springs are stretched. Hardware kit like this doesn't cost very much, even from the parts store. <clears throat> and if you need, you know, replacing those springs is not a bad idea. Um, one time I worked on a vehicle that somebody had been driving it with a park brake on and they had taken the temper out of all of the springs. All of the springs were just stretched and they'd been overheated and they didn't have any spring to them anymore. Uh, but it's not a bad idea to replace the hardware anyway. 
uh, when you're doing a brake job, if you want to really do a belt and suspenders brake job, that's new adjusters. Remember the adjusters are, are left hand thread on one side, right hand thread on the other, so you got to make sure you don't get the adjusters crossed up and all that. But a lot of this, now this kit right here, this, this lever and this cable will be separate items. And you won't get a new one of these unless you order special, but typically what you'll get is you'll get this spring, these two springs in their little covers. You'll get an adjuster sometimes and sometimes you won't. And you get this spring, that spring, and that spring. So um, that's how that works. <clears throat> anyway, not a bad idea to go ahead and, but if you're if you're scared, you're not going to be able to get them put back together the right way. Do them one side at the time so you got the other side. Or take a picture with your cell phone. You can do that too, you know. Uh, <clears throat> if the shoes are so badly worn that you can't get the drums off, uh, now sometimes the drums are sealed, I mean, are in there uh, so rusted onto the hub that you got to bang on them with a hammer to get them off of there and all that. Uh, but if you stick a screwdriver through there and you push this away from that wheel, because this only lets the wheel turn one way, uh, then you can actually use your brake spoon to reverse the, that adjuster and bring those shoes back in so that they disengage from where they've ground themselves into the drums and all that. Now adjust the drum brakes correctly for a good pedal. That's really important. Um, these little tool right here, like you see I'm using, I could have put a picture of the actual tool on there. I've never used one of those, but I can see how it would be really handy. If you don't have the brake uh, shoes adjusted close enough to the drums, then you're going to have a pedal that goes down too far. You let go of it, it goes down again, it feels normal. It's not spongy, it just takes two applications, and the second one, the pedal feels nice and high. Now, if you adjust those shoes back out right there where they're close to the drums, and you hit the brake, it doesn't, it's got just, just the right amount of travel. It doesn't have too much travel and then just the right amount in the second application. And uh, don't be lazy about that. If you match those brakes and they don't, they feel like I'm talking about, go back there and readjust those rear brakes. Um, double check everything, and I mean everything. Uh, go back and double check every uh, single fastener, the one that holds the uh, caliper in place, the one that holds the caliper cage. Uh, the caliper cage, it's best to use a torque wrench on the caliper bracket. I call it a caliper cage too. Uh, this was one of my students using a torque wrench on that caliper bracket because uh, you'd be surprised how much the torque specs are on some of these caliper brackets. Uh, because, I mean, I've, I've seen them to where they, the caliper bracket had more of a torque spec than the lug nuts. Uh, but cause, a lot of people is, you know, tighten them up with a hand wrench and don't worry about it or spin them up with an impact wrench, but I always taught my people to use a torque wrench, not only on lug nuts, but also on the uh, caliper bracket bolts. Um, typically the bolts, uh, there's a, it, the bolt, the torque is not very much on the actual, the bolt the, that holds the caliper into the bracket. Those little bolts are typically don't have a whole lot of torque to them, so don't put the caliper bracket torque, uh, which is on these big bolts, don't put that on these, you know. Now with brake parts, you get what you pay for. When you buy cheap parts, you get cheap parts. And when you use cheap parts, you might wind up with a dissatisfied customer. I ran into that before. If the supplier is pushing brake parts that are priced too good to be true, they probably are. Brake shoes, though, don't usually cost that much. Now some of your Chevys, uh, like 2012, 2015, whatever, they'll have actually the part brake cable that comes with the brake shoes and stuff like that on their drum brakes on the rear. So, uh, you know, some of those brakes, some of them cost more. It depends on how they're configured and all that stuff. And also on your duo servo brakes, which is the ones that have the adjuster at the bottom and it swings back and forth whenever you get them against the anchor pin at the top. The short shoe goes to the front, the long shoe goes to the back. Now, that's just the way that is. You put them on wrong. There was this Cajun guy down there that had four wheel drum brakes on his old pickup. And he put brake shoes on there and he was able to do the springs and all. But he put the long shoes, you know, you got a long shoe and a short shoe on each one. He put the long shoes on the right front and the left rear and the short shoes on the left front and the right rear. And uh, that Cajun guy, when he came to talk to the David Hughes at the parts house about it, he goes, when I hit my brakes, I go back to where I come from. So David drove the truck and the first time he mashed the brakes, the thing did a, a 180 in the middle of the road. <laughs> so be careful about that too. Uh, use the right brake fluid, good brake fluid, uh, and find out, you know, what your brake fluid is supposed to be because you might be surprised because um, uh, don't use, uh, well, if you've got ABS, uh, you know, the, the, the silicone, the DOT5 silicone fluid, 
uh, is will make a foam when you're when it's trying to go through any ABS systems. That's very dangerous. Now they make a dot five point one zero or something like that. It's past the dot five, um, and it's you know just do your research on your brake fluid. Make sure you use exactly what's called for on your vehicle. Don't just guess at what kept brake fluid you poured in there. Uh, my friend Adam bought some really cheap brake fluid from the dollar store and almost immediately noticed the master cylinder reservoir gasket swelled up uh, which is like means you know, if you put oil or if somebody puts any oil petroleum based anything in the brake system it swells up all the rubber in that system and just ruins everything causes it all to lock down the brakes don't fail they just lock up and the car won't go and everything has got to be replaced including you know your ABS part sometimes so make darn sure that you don't accidentally pour oil in there um, you're, you would be better off putting water in there than in some kind of petroleum based stuff anyway I'm not saying to put water in there but make sure you use the right brake fluid banjo fitting that feeds the caliper requires two washers it's got one here and one here and I'm going to tell you something that banjo bolt is easy to twist off and if you break off a banjo bolt and they don't have a replacement at the parts house, that vehicle's dead in the water when very likely the customer is expecting to get it back in an hour and a half. That thing will be dead in the water until the parts store can get you the right banjo bolt. So be doggone sure you're careful about the torque on those banjo bolts. Might want to look that up. Use a little inch pound torque wrench to tighten them up. Uh, but anyway, that is super important. Now, had that happen, this one guy thought since this bolt is big I need to tighten it this tight and he busted it right on off of there. Bleeder screws, the rubber caps on there to keep dirt and water out. I don't know how many times I've seen them where I had to you know take the bleeder screw out and clean all the crud out of it before I could even bleed the brakes because it was stopped up with rust and dirt all the way down to the bottom. Uh, <clears throat> put it back, put that rubber cap back on it when you're through. You might be the next person to bleed the brakes. You don't have to deal with that. If the bleeder screws clogged or stripped, you might need a replacement. You can buy those from the parts store. Usually they have them in little assortments or whatever. If you put the calipers on the wrong side, and I used to do this just to play a joke on my students, I'd put the calipers on the wrong side of the, of the uh, Ford Ranger trainer, and that would put the bleeder at the bottom, which is not supposed to be down here. It's just not supposed to be down here. It's actually supposed to be up here because the air is going to go up. But see, if you put the, it's easy to put them on backwards. So make sure you don't mess up on that. But I would do that and tell them bleed the brakes. And they work, 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 work. We wouldn't be able to get the brakes bled, brakes, <laughs> brakes bled because I had put the calipers on the wrong side on purpose, you see. But just remember that. That bleeder's got to go up on the top. <clears throat> when you're bleeding the brakes, you need to keep the master cylinder full because if it runs low on fluid, you're going to have a bunch of air in the brakes you got to deal with again. And so what I'd do is I'd get a drink bottle, I'd clean it out really good, or some other kind of bottle. It's best not to leave something like this sitting around for people to take a drink out of. But basically, if you put this brake fluid in there and you stand it up in the master cylinder so that the top of it is underneath the level of the fluid, then it will actually burble down, you keep filling, that, like a chicken house, chicken waterer. Uh, as the brake fluid is used out of the reservoir, so you've increased the size of your reservoir and you've also got a sight glass up here. And so that's a really handy way to keep your master cylinder full when you're bleeding the brakes. The fluid won't leave the bottle unless it's needed. See, it's not going to run out of there and run over because it can't get any air until it's able to, you know, uh, let some more fluid out of there. Anyway, that works really good. I, that was a trick I came up with a long time ago. I don't know anybody else that does this unless I told them to do it. Maybe somebody does. I don't know. Now, when you're bleeding the brakes, you typically start at the wheel farther from the master cylinder and work your way to the closest one. You go one, two, three, four. They're configured a bunch of different ways, though, so always pay attention uh, to the way they're supposed to be. I'll talk about that again in a minute. Uh, but if there's a huge air bubble that's working its way down the line, you may be seeing really good fluid coming out into your bleeder, I mean, out of your bleeder, when there is a big air bubble pushing that clear fluid out of there. And until that air bubble makes it to the bleeder and works its way out, you're not going to get all the air out of there and you're still going to have a spongy pedal. I like to take a rubber hose, mount it into a bottle, you know, wire, whatever, drill a hole in the cap, the hose fits tight in, and a little air hole in the cap so that the, as the fluid goes in there, you know, the air can leave. And I hang that with a piece of wire so that all four bleeders have got a bottle on them. Loosen all four bleeders, and I just pump those brakes 
until all of those bottles, you know, you know, have making sure that I've got that bottle up in the top, filling it up. And when you get to all that, you can flush the brakes that way too. Works really good. And so you keep on working it through there until all the air's out of there. You can usually get all the air that way. However, there was a friend of mine that had an 08 Nissan Frontier, and it had been in an accident. And he had everything else was done right, but they never could get the brake pedal to feel like it was supposed to feel. He brought it to us. I looked it up. On that Nissan, you were supposed to bleed this one, then that one, then this one, and then that one. If you bled those wheels in any other order or used any other method, you would never get all the air out of those brakes. So that is really important. So dig around in your service uh, material and find out what the order you're supposed to bleed the brakes in. That is super important. I can't stress that enough. Now, why for service precautions? Don't forget to check the shop manual literature if you're having trouble. Sometimes you've got to use a scan tool to turn on the ABS unit to get the air out of it. You know, you have to run the pump in the ABS unit because it's got a pump in there. And so this is a, an example of anti-lock brake system procedures. You can read over that. That's not on all of them. That's just on one particular vehicle. See, this is actually a GM procedure here with some of your Fords and all. And some of the ones with ABS don't require anything. Some of them used to have a little button you were supposed to push on the ABS valve and they had a tool to hold that and blah, 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 you know. Now, after you're through with the entire brake job, before you ever put that vehicle in gear, pump the brakes to get those pads out to the rotors. Because if you don't do that, the first time you hit the brake, you may not have any while you're moving the pad. So pump, 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 pump. Don't ever put it in gear. You can start it, but don't put it in gear until you've pumped those brakes out and that pedal feels just like it's supposed to. And uh, not a bad idea to pump it and have somebody look for leaks while you're doing it, too. But the long and the short of it is, I have seen people get in trouble by putting it in gear, starting to back out of the shop, and all of a sudden, you, when you mash the brake, there, there's no brakes, and you're frantically trying to hit it again and again, and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Season the brake pads. This is what Bendix has to do. Bendix recommends you drive it and make 30 normal stops from 30 miles an hour with a 30 second cool down each time to burnish the brakes. And these are gentle stops, but not abusive panic stops. It's a good idea, but most shops won't even take time to do this. So you're burnishing the pads and matching them to the rotors and all that. Uh, some of the cheaper brake pads that you get, even though there's nothing wrong with them, when those uh, linings start to season, they stink and they smoke and they just smell terrible. And you can basically tell when you bought some cheap brake pads when they stink and smoke and there's nothing wrong with the way they were installed or anything. Know how to do this seriously. Pay close attention to everything you're doing. Whenever you just settle into a routine to where you've, you're, you can do it without even thinking about it, that's when you make mistakes. So you gotta have your mind, just like Yoda said, you need to have your mind on where you are and what you're doing instead of thinking about something else. That's really important. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this one, and I hope you got some good out of it. And I really appreciate you guys watching to the end. And I will see you guys next time.